So maybe a first question would be, give us a state of just your tribe. Madison has just been designated in December, Truax Field, as the home of F-35A. Doctor, can you start? Give us an overview. When Mr. Stile went to Washington, that would be first-term Republican, first district congressman Brian Stile, he found that the U.S. House, in which he just joined, had uh, gone Democratic. Washington was waiting on the Mueller report, and now that it's in, some U.S. House members, Democrats, are calling for the I word, the impeachment of the president. So it's a great time to ask first district congressman Brian Stile, thanks very much for coming in. Thanks for having me. The transition from business executive to Congress. U.S. House, lessons learned? It's going to be a lot slower process than it would be in the private sector, but you kind of know that going in, and so you got to have some sobriety to that. I mean, our country is approaching 250 years in the making. Uh, sometimes there's slow change. Sometimes there's quick, per, quick transformative change, but that's not always the case. And so you're going in, you're trying to work, get yourself in the weeds, figure out where you can make a difference, in particular during this period of time of divided government. Right. Where can you be impactful to make a difference? And where can you set up the transformative change that our country needs uh, when that opportunity presents itself? U.S. House, based on <clears throat> seniority, power tied to seniority. You come in, your party's out of control, you're one of how many first-term Republican freshmen? About 30 freshmen uh, Republicans, about 90 freshmen total. So you're at the bottom of the power chain. It's not news to you, but how do you sort out, how can I make an impact here, Congressman? I would say you do your homework. And so the power goes to, there's an aspect of seniority, but there's an aspect of mastering the material. And so if you go in and you dive into the policy, you understand uh, the intricacies of that policy to figure out how to get things done, I think you can be uniquely impactful. Uh, if you go to day one, we arrived, I arrived during a government shutdown. Yeah. Um, there's the reactive side of that, or how do we get that back open? But then there's also the proactive side, how do we prevent that from happening again? And that gets into kind of the weeds, right? That's the, that's the policy that I like, but that's the, the geeky stuff. And you go and you say, let's review kind of the budget process. Let's address the process of this that got us into the shutdown in the first place change the rules so we don't get back here again. And so I introduced a bill, uh, bipartisan Democrats and Republicans that said, let's end shutdowns from ever happening again. And I think you can gain leverage and be impactful if you're willing to do the homework and do the policy work such that you can have those conversations with your colleagues uh, in an informed way to make substantive changes to improve the process for everybody. With a U.S. House so dominated by seniority, <coughs> do you get a chance in your caucus to make those points. Can you move the pile a little bit by offering your fresh perspective? Absolutely. Yeah, in the, in the Republican conference, I think we're less focused on seniority uh, than any of, the, uh, any of the other Senate or Democrats in the House. Uh, we require a turnover of um, committee chairs after six years. Mm -hmm. And so that brings in fresh blood. Uh, it keeps the, the conference a little bit younger uh, and a little bit newer uh, on the Republican side in the House. And that opportunity to go and speak with your colleagues is there every day, Democrat or Republican. Uh, it's not everybody, I think, puts in the legwork to go do that. I mean, we're on the floor uh, for votes every day. That's your opportunity to go up, speak to your colleagues, in particular colleagues that are influential on committees or that have a, a history of working in specific areas, share your policy ideas. But again, if you go in and talk talking points, I don't think that's helpful. I think what you have to do is substantively know the area of policy that you're working on, then have that conversation. I think you can move the ball forward. Um, two questions. You've been there almost <coughs> four months. Most satisfying part of the job, most frustrating part of the job, Congressman? Most frustrating part of the job is how partisan some of the bills are that are brought to the floor. And so I'd give the example of kind of day one, the bills that were brought to the floor weren't even there to really end the shutdown. They were partisan messaging bills. That's frustrating. In the private sector, you'd say, lock everybody in a room, take away everybody's cell phones, yeah. turn off the TVs, and nobody's leaving until the job is done. And at least in the private sector, when your manager would come in and tell you that, shockingly, somewhere about 5.30 on a Friday mm -hmm. is when cooler heads would prevail and a resolution would be reached because everybody wanted to go home for the weekend. Yeah. I was frustrated that wasn't the approach we were taking to resolve what I thought was a, which, which is a really serious problem where we had the government shut down. The most, the most positive aspect though, I think is when the cameras are off and we're talking about things that are what I call kind of one below the radar, 
I think there is an ability to have a conversation to figure out how do we make some incremental progress if you're willing to go back and do the work. And so I've spent time working on human trafficking. I've worked on how do we reform the overall budget process with my colleagues. These aren't exciting topics maybe that make it onto cable TV news. You don't see it on CNN, MSNBC, or Fox News uh, in your evening because they're maybe not that exciting, but I think they are important and transformative, and that's where I like to kind of do my work. What advice has the <coughs> Mr. Ryan, Speaker Ryan, who left, who, who retired, and giving you a chance to serve in, in the U.S. House, what advice has he given you? I, I think what you can really learn from Paul Ryan is that you can disagree without being disagreeable, and that you can fight fight policy and not people. And I think what we see far too often in Washington is people that go out there and they don't want to they don't want to actually have the intellectual conversation on the idea. They want to fight the person. And so instead of, instead of having a thoughtful conversation of why one policy is better than another, they'll, they'll call the person stupid, right? That, to me, is unproductive. If you can work and try to be and disagree with the idea, but not always fight the person, I think you're going to be better off. I think that's kind of a bit of a Wisconsin-style approach. Uh, and I think Washington would be better off for that if we all brought that to the table. The pundits say of Mr. Ryan's tenure, ground up <coughs> by dealing with President Trump and by dealing with the Freedom Caucus. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, you know, looking back, I think he brought great big ideas uh, to the table. I think we got uh, tax reform done that's made our economy competitive, that's encouraged investment, has encouraged the job growth that we're seeing. And worsen, worsen the deficit, though, hasn't it? Well, we're also seeing the economic growth. And so we're going to have to grow our economy at a rate that's going to pull us out of the long-term debt and deficit that we've seen. And so the economic growth we've seen, the employment uh, unemployment rate coming down, the number of people entering the job market, in particular underrepresented minority groups, mm -hmm. as we've seen those unemployment rates come down, those are really positive changes. We need to continue this economic growth, and that in large part is going to address what we're seeing is our fiscal house in order. We also need to address that big picture. You were named to the, uh, mem uh, you're a member of the Financial Services Committee, <coughs> and your website says you um, will be part of the discussion on accessing home loans and student loan debt. Update me on both of those issues, home loans and student loan debt. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are in receivership. That, that limits their ability to go in and to make home loans uh, to individuals. And we saw after 2008, as we had that financial crisis, though individuals had a really difficult time to get a home loan, in particular people who were trying to get their first home loan. Mm -hmm. That overall needs to come out of receivership, kind of this overall bankruptcy process to oversimplify it. We need to get that out of receivership, have that fully functioning so people have access, in particular, to get a loan for their first, for their first home. In the United States, home ownership is higher than most of the rest of the world, in large part because of the federal policies that have been put in place to encourage investment in our home and in our communities. Um, as you look at student loans, we're sitting at the Department of Education with a $1.5 trillion hold on with, student loans. With a T, trillion. Trillion, trillion with a T. In Washington, we deal with trillions. And so that is going to be the next major shoe to fall. We saw what happened when Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had their s real serious problems after the financial crisis in 2008. I'm nervous that the next one coming down is the student loan crisis and spending a lot of time figuring out how we deal with this. I served on the University of Wisconsin Board of Regents uh, before I ran for office. So I come to the table, I think, with a little bit of perspective and understanding of the overall higher education system that's driving a lot of these loans across the country. First and foremost, we need to control the underlying cost of the educational product. Mm -hmm. The University of Wisconsin system does a very good job of that, in particular compared to their peers across the United States. And in, in Wisconsin, for the last six years, and it looks like it's going to be the same case going forward uh, under our new governor, is that we've held the line on tuition for under, undergraduate in-state students. That's important because the actual, under, the actual underlying cost of the product is being held down. That prevents you from having these huge loans that are going out going forward. But we have a real serious problem, and we have younger people, my generation and younger, sitting with $1.5 trillion in debt is delaying their ability to purchase their first home, to purchase a car, to save for retirement. And I think more than anything, we need to address the underlying cost of education that's driving up uh, student debt across the nation. Having worked on this <coughs> issue of student loan debt, how do, how do you respond when some Democratic presidential candidates suggest that community colleges and public universities should be free to get rid of the debt problem? 
bad idea? Well, I think you, you need two things there. So one, you do want investment by the, the public sector. And the state of Wisconsin is a great partner in investing in higher education. But you also want students to have skin in the game. So you want to have both. If it's, if it's free, it distorts the market. And now people will take out will we'll take this resource without thinking it all the way through. So you want to make sure that students have some level of skin in the game. You don't want to give things away for free. But at the same time, you want to make it affordable and accessible. And so I think having that partnership is a good track that we've done. The, the other piece of the puzzle, in addition to the total cost of tuition, is the living expenses side. Mm -hmm. And when you look at students that are coming out, the average student in the state of Wisconsin is roughly $30,000 in debt per student. That's after, the rough. After a four-year bachelor's that, degree? Yep, that's the, that's the rough math to kind of scope that out. And you think about there's the tuition piece of the puzzle, but there's also the living expenses. And to get students through in four years instead of five is a huge piece of that puzzle to cut down those living expenses. And so when you're talking about just the tuition, that's one piece of the puzzle. The other piece of the puzzle is the living expenses side. How do we make sure that students who are taking out debt for their living expenses are doing that in as cost-effective way as possible? Because that, when compounded after they graduate, if they're paying back a cell phone bill from eight years ago and a compounded interest, that's a real serious problem. If they're paying that back on the actual underlying education, that's a proper investment. Uh, it makes a little more economic sense. Well, just one follow-up question on, on this issue. How do you feel about the idea of refinancing student loan debt, which is an issue in Wisconsin. The governor brought it up in his budget message. And how do you feel about the concept of forgiving student loan debt, which some say would be irresponsible? I think you create a moral hazard where you simply go in and forgive student loan debt. Okay. I think that creates a moral hazard uh, for generations to come, where people will no longer be economically rational in taking out the student loan if you think that there's a high likelihood that that debt's going to be forgiven. So I think that's a, a real serious risk. I think as we look at the refinancing and we talk about how can the state invest and help students, I think more than anything is focusing in on the original cost of the product in the first place. That prevents the, that prevents the whole conversation going forward. If we can address how do we deliver an educational product that's high quality in a more efficient way where we can limit the actual cost of the underlying product. Okay. Um, I've not read the Mueller report. Uh, I've don't know if you have, but you've certainly read a summary. Your reaction to it, sir? I think it's positive that what we don't have is evidence of collusion. I think that's, that's positive. It allows us now to take our step forward and go back to doing the work that the American people want to see us do, which is how do you prepare workers for the jobs of the future? How do you address this? Con how do we continue our economic growth? How do we lower the cost of health care? So I think that's a, a big positive. We also continue to see evidence that Russia has been involved in trying to destabilize democracies around the globe. And as we are less than two years away from the upcoming United States election, mm -hmm. I think that, that puts that at the front burner, that we need to make sure that Russia is held in check. That's the Russia destabilizing Ukraine, Georgia, Syria, getting involved in the French elections, the United States elections. We need to have a real serious conversation to make sure uh, that we're putting in place and checking uh, Russia's attempts to destabilize democracies around the globe. Do we need a, um, I'm going to use the term, the overused term, blue ribbon panel to be <coughs> sure that there are preventative ways that Russia cannot influence in 2020 as it tried to influence in 2018 and the evidence in 2016? I, I, I'm open to, uh, to any reasonable approach as to how we limit uh, Russia's actions to try to destabilize democracies around the globe, including our own. Uh, if that's a Blue Ribbon Commission, if that's other approaches, I'm willing to sit down at the table and have a, a nonpartisan uh, discussion from a national security standpoint as to how we're going to do that, and then to hold Russia accountable uh, for their actions when they do uh, that type of behavior. The most liberal Democrats, including <coughs> uh, those, some of those running for president, say the House should begin impeachment proceedings. If it did, would we have a constitutional crisis on our hands, Congressman? I, I don't agree too often with Nancy Pelosi probably on everything, but I think she's actually pretty logical there that I think we're too, we, I don't think moving forward with an impeachment process uh, is productive in any, any way, shape, or form. 
Um, I think what we see is people kind of talking to their base on the far left, uh, trying to gin up their presidential ambitions uh, by talking about impeachment. I don't think it's productive. Um, and I don't think actually we're going to actually see that in the House. There's kind of ongoing investigations in the House for this and that. Um, I think that partisan bickering is what frustrates so many Americans. I think most people that I talk to day in and day out uh, want to see Congress focused in on key issues that are affecting them every day, not the partisan bickering that we get uh, and that is so frequently on our cable TV news. Well, um, if Robert <coughs> Mueller and former counsel Don McCann appear before Congress, well, do you think that they should appear to clear up some of the questions raised by the Mueller, Mueller report? I voted to make the Mueller report public. I think it's good that it's now uh, available for everyone to read, including Congress. Uh, and I have no problem uh, with them coming and testifying before Congress. Okay. Uh, any specific questions you might ask? I mean, you're not on the panel. I, I won't be on the Committee of Jurisdiction. Um, you know, I, we'll see what kind of questions the Committee of Jurisdiction asks, and I'll be paying attention closely. Okay. Um, let's turn to President Trump. Why should he win Wisconsin in 2020? I think he made a really clear case in 2016 about the economic growth that we need to see. We used to talk about you know, the new normal of economic growth being 2% growth. Well, we've thrown that to the wayside as we've actually gone in and made very serious and positive changes to our economy, in particular some of the tax reform that makes us competitive on a global scale. I think as we see some of this economic growth, it's the result of some of the good economic policies that have been put in place. And across the board, these conservative policies have been implemented. We're reaping the benefits of them. Uh, and I think when you go toe to toe uh, and talk about the economic policies that have been put in place, it's a pretty clear case uh, yeah. as to why it makes sense to, to reelect. Personal style. Do you wish he wouldn't govern by tweets? Yeah, I, I have a totally different approach. I'm not here to coach the president. Uh, but uh, yeah, my, my approach, I think most people in Wisconsin's approach is different, but to each their own. I mean, the, the American people uh, clearly support it. Um, yeah, I support the policies. I s wish sometimes he probably would behave and tweet differently, but I'm not here to uh, give advice to the president. How has President Trump's first term been good for Wisconsin and, I, and, and the first district? I, I think first and foremost is you look at the economic growth that we're seeing. We're looking at companies investing in Wisconsin. And why do you care about that? Because as we've invested in Wisconsin, we've seen a tightening in the labor market. And you care about that because that's what drives wages up. And we're starting to see the beginning of wage growth. We're behind where we need to be. There's room for improvement. But when you start to see this progress, where we start to see the unemployment rate come down, people joining the labor market, wages starting to move up, we want to continue that process to see wages increase for people across the state of Wisconsin. And turning and going back to the failed economic policies of the past is not a step forward, that's a step back. And the people that I talk to want to see this continuation of economic growth. They want to see wages rise. And I think we're on the path to do that. Well, the Fox on campus <coughs> in Mount Pleasant is in your district. Yeah. Given all the discussion back and forth, what do you expect a year, a year and a half from now? The investment by Foxconn in the Mount Pleasant campus and the number of people they're going to employ in Wisconsin. What are you hearing? I, I'm encouraging everyone to come and invest in southeast Wisconsin. I was actually, I drove by uh, the Foxconn campus yesterday on my way to University of Wisconsin Parkside. They're mo moving and making progress. The, the contract with them is between Foxconn and the state of Wisconsin. That's yeah. not a contract. Uh, that I am involved in or will be involved in in the future. I'm focused in on how do you put in place federal policies that encourage everyone uh, to come, invest, and hire people in southeast Wisconsin. And the refrain that I get time and again, if it's Foxconn, if it's Herringbow, or if it's a local company looking to expand, and I talk to folks and I say, why are you expanding right here in southeast Wisconsin in Racine County and Kenosha County? Um, in particular, that I-94 corridor from the Milwaukee airport to the state line, which is seeing just exponential economic growth. Mm -hmm. Time and again, they say, look, we need to have all these policies in place. Keep doing that piece of it. But we have the best workforce here in the state of Wisconsin, not just in the United States, but anywhere around the globe. And I think sometimes when you're from Wisconsin, you see it day in and day out, you forget how great our workforce is. And you really get that perspective when you talk to people that are making decisions on a national and on a global scale. Their decision-making process, why they want to come and invest in Wisconsin, is we have the best workers anywhere in the world, hands down. Foxconn founder Terry Gao, though, has just announced that he's received a vision and he's going to run for president of Taiwan. Do you think that will take his eye off the economic development ball for Wisconsin? 
these are large companies, and Foxconn's a multi-billion uh, dollar global company. I think they're going to continue with their investment plan. I encourage uh, them, and I encourage everyone to come and invest uh, in the state of Wisconsin and hire our best and brightest. Uh, we'll see what actually comes out of that. I don't have a crystal ball uh, into any company's uh, investment decision. What I can do is stay focused on making sure we have policies in place that encourage investment and encourage hiring uh, right here in our state. You uh, came to Congress from the uh, uh, private sector businesses. Are businesses in the first district <coughs> telling you that they're being hurt by the tariffs, the whole tariff debate? We, we see real struggles off the tariffs. In particular, southeast Wisconsin uh, are net users of aluminum and steel. Uh, we're, we don't produce aluminum and steel uh, really in southeast Wisconsin at all. And so we need to get through this phase into the next phase. And what I mean by that is the president came in and shook up the trade agreement yeah. process, which is good in the sense that we had trade agreements that weren't as fair to American workers and American farmers as they should have been. Mm -hmm. He shook things up. We're feeling that pain right now. My, ob my objective is to get from step one to step two as quickly as possible. Uh, USMCA, what I call new NAFTA, um, is coming down the pipe. I think that's a great step forward. That's with Canada and Mexico. Yeah, Canada and Mexico, yes. kind of new NAFTA. And if you take one example out of that, for years, Canada's had a very convoluted milk pricing scheme that makes it very difficult for Wisconsin dairy farmers to take our milk and to export it to Canada. That doesn't make any sense. What we see in the new NAFTA, USMCA, is a whole different regime that's going to allow Wisconsin dairy farmers to take their milk and sell it in Canada. That's a huge step forward. I think what we saw is the president shake things up. We need to get these new agreements in place as quickly as we can and then bring these tariffs and barriers to trade down. The ultimate goal is to remove barriers to trade because if given the opportunity to ship and trade our goods that we manufacture and we grow and raise here in Wisconsin around the globe, we'll win every time. Well, you mentioned Mexico. Um, the immigration debate, no greater issue nationally. Next steps that should be taken to resolve what the president calls <coughs> is a, a crisis. Uh, you voted for that. Um, remind me how you voted on that. Uh, I voted in favor of putting a permanent structure on the southern border a wall. Thank you. And so it's it's a double negative, which makes it confusing to talk about, right? Because right. it was to, was to, was to remove the second one, wrong. and so it gets complicated uh, on the exact wording of it. But I do think it's important that we secure the southern border of the United States. I think we have a real problem there. It's a humanitarian crisis. And what we need to do, it's a multifaceted approach. One of the facets gets a lot of attention, and that's to put a permanent barrier in specific locations on the southern border, a wall, if you will, to assist in the overall objective of getting situational control on the southern border. The other pieces of that puzzle is technology and manpower. And so when you talk to the Border Patrol and individuals who are involved in homeland security and securing our southern border, it's a multifaceted approach that's required. Disproportionately, we put attention on the wall. That's important to have a physical security barrier in specific locations. I support it. I think the president's request is reasonable. I'd like to see all of us get behind that. But that doesn't remove the al also the need for technology and manpower to get situational control on the southern border. Well, but you, what's your response when the president has said, I may close the border? And you've seen the numbers. 1.7 billion worth of goods go back and forth per day. Do you think he will end up, he's given Mexico a year, closing the border, uh, would that, uh, do you favor that? I'd like to not see us get there. I'd like to see us actually just go and secure the border in a rational and thoughtful way. Everybody's got their negotiating tactics as to what they want to bring to the table to negotiate. I'm focused in on what is the end result that we need to get. We need to get situational control on the southern border. I think there's three key facets to get there. I think it's manpower, technology, and physical barriers. And I'd like to see us back have a rational debate, actually talk about the policy. I get frustrated uh, with folks on the, on the far left and maybe folks on the far right that don't want to talk about the substantive policy that's going to get us an end result that's going to actually get the situational control that I think everybody uh, more or less agrees that we need to be able to have on the southern border. What about cutting off foreign <coughs> aid to Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala? I think that's also kind of this broader negotiating tactic. I think when you look at the push, right, that's encouraging individuals from those three countries in particular uh, to take the journey to the United States of America, we need to make sure that those countries are putting in place policies that make their country safer, more secure, economically secure, and physical safety security. 
uh, that's what's pushing those individuals. And we need to have that conversation with those countries, I think, as a bit of a negotiating tactic to talk about fully removing uh, the funding for those countries. Uh, but I think we do need to make sure that those three countries in particular are doing their role of making sure that they remove this necessity for the push. And for a basic humanitarian aspect, we need to make sure that countries in our hemisphere are safe and secure. I, mean, I think that's a broader uh, conversation that we need to okay, have. Okay, but at the moment, you don't support cutting off foreign aid to those three countries. No, I think it's a bit of a negotiating tactic, but I think we do need to bring those countries to the table and let them know that we're serious, uh, that we're providing financial assistance to these countries. And in doing so, they need to reciprocate by putting in place policies that make their countries safe and secure. More and more Democrats in Washington <coughs> seem to be lining up in favor of this concept, Medicare for all. <laughs> Bad idea? Terrible idea. What? It, what it's going to ultimately do is destroy our, our overall health care system as we know it. It's unaffordable. It's a $32 trillion program by many accounts. It ends employer-based health care. The United States has a major issue with the rising cost of health care. Shifting that purely onto the taxpayer and removing uh, our current structure in place, I think, is the wrong approach. What I think we, we need to do is put more power in the decision-making process with individuals and doctors. One aspect of this is health savings accounts. That's not, and I think where the problem here is on the right on this conversation is, there's not always a silver bullet that one idea addresses all of our problems. But what we need to do is know that and then figure out where are these areas where we can focus in to lower the cost of health care. Again, going back, the health savings accounts empowers individuals and their doctors to make health care decisions that are in their own best interest. It allows them to drive down the cost of health care and improve quality. I think we need to continually look for areas where we can lower the cost of health care. And we're going to see a lot of discussion about um, prescription drugs uh, coming up here in the next few months. There's a lot of ideas on the table to make sure that we're in, this, in the same way, lowering the cost of health care. But I think moving to a socialized medicine approach uh, that we see leads to rationed care and leads to lower quality of care, uh, and I don't think we should be moving in that direction. Well, 19, soon to be 20 with Mr. Biden, uh, Democrats have now announced for president. Who do you consider the two or three most serious potential candidates against President Trump next year? We'll see who comes out of this. I mean, there, it seems like it's a who's who of running. I feel like every day somebody from the House or the Senate uh, joins the, the group of Democrats that are running. They're obviously going to end in Milwaukee, and we'll figure out uh, who they choose. I'll let the Democrats figure out who they're going to run uh, for president. Uh, but I do think that the economic policies uh, that President Trump has been putting in place uh, over the past handful of years is what's leading to our economic growth. Uh, and I think it's a clear case uh, for re-election. Do you think we're making any progress with North Korea? You know, it's hard to really tell what's going on behind the scenes. So I do think just we... just launch another test, although not right. a... Right, not a, not a ballistic. Right. And so you get into this conversation on the national security side. I do think the fact that these countries are willing to come to the table and talk to, is a real testament to the fact that we're holding countries accountable and we're properly reinvesting in our military. Our military, for a handful of years under the previous administration, uh, I think had been underfunded and been gutted out. I think the reinvestment that we've seen in the United States uh, military has been positive and has brought countries back to the table uh, to negotiate. We need to negotiate with a big stick. I think we're getting back in the position to be able to do that. Um, it's hard to tell what's going on behind the scenes exactly with North Korea. I'm always cautiously optimistic that we can reach a proper resolution. Uh, but North Korea, until they show a sign that they're willing to take a step forward, we need to continue to put maximum pressure on North Korea to come to the table. Two final questions. We're almost out of time. You are co-chair with an Illinois Democrat of the <coughs> Middle Class Jobs Caucus. What are realistic goals for that caucus? I think more than anything, in my conversation with my colleagues across the aisle and saying, let's find areas where we can work together. There's all this partisanship on some of the transformative change, but where there's areas we can work together, we're very focused in on um, you know, workforce development. How do we make sure we're preparing individuals for the jobs of the future? How do we make sure that decision makers, in particular education decision makers, have the flexibilities that they need at the local level to respond to the workforce needs that they're seeing right here in our home communities? And then the final question, this is my term. Are you optimistic that the dysfunction, my term, in Congress, progress can be made before the November 2020 election, or are you 
hope more hopeful about the long-term prospect of ending my term dysfunction. Let me, let me bifurcate that. I think that you can get stuff done if it's below the radar. So if it's not something that's interesting enough and sexy enough to be on cable TV at night, if you're talking about flood insurance, export import bank, terrorism risk insurance, I think those are things that we can work together to get done. And that's where I'm in the trenches working every day to result in actual policy a, a, achievements that benefit the American public. Those aren't the transformative changes that we also need. I think the transformative changes where we address some of our rising costs of health care, where we're seeing our debt and deficit continue to slip away, that transformative change I think is going to be much more challenging in a period of divided government. Uh, but I am optimistic that after the 2020 election we're going to come back to the table and really work to tackle those bigger issues. First District Congressman Brian Stile, Republican from Janesville, thanks for the four-month update. Hope to see you back soon. Thanks for having me. Uh, different update. Absolutely. And report card. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.